Discord. Hello, everyone in the U.S. and around the world. Thanks for joining us wherever you are. Hopefully, you're safe. Stay in. Listen to everybody, and we'll be back playing baseball soon. What a great guest we have today. A great story of perseverance, determination, and willpower. He turned down Miami and Harvard, signed out of high school in the major leagues by 20, featured in Sports Illustrated as this year's phenom. Talk about pressure. Not always possibly a rosy road. We're going to ask him a little bit about that. Um, but as he's always said, I've read this about him. He said, if you allow your past to dictate your attitude, you will lose the World Series of life. He's played, coached, managed in four decades of Major League Baseball, Hall of Fame manager one day, but already a Hall of Famer of life. This is a great thrill, former manager of the Pirates and the Colorado Rockies. He's done so much. Everybody knows him. There's no reason for a major introduction. A great person, individual, Clint Hurdle. Clint, thanks for joining us, man. This is a great honor. <laughs> well, Peter, thank you. I'm humbled to be here. I'm honored to serve. I'm waiting for the guy you're talking about to come walking in my house in any minute. Um, that was quite the introduction. So thank you. You're welcome. It's uh, it, we've known each other a while, so I'm happy to uh, to be a part of a you getting out here and then trying to provide some some opportunity for some to share some maybe some experience, some strength, and some hope with some people. Absolutely. You know, I've read about you. Also, you know, you talk about you know, uh, everybody should be treated equally. You treat everybody in the clubhouse. It doesn't matter. The person cleaning the stadium equal. I could tell just by talking to you, that's how you are. When my wife and I met you, you know, it's like we've known you for years. I mean, you, you just treat everybody first class. I'd like to take everybody back a little bit. Um, you know, I'm an Italian American. I got a lot of pride being Italian American. I, and there's a lot of great managers and coaches that are Italian Americans also. Um, and I believe it's got to do with family, passion and all that. You've got a great family. You've called them the Mount Rushmore of mentors. Um, let's talk about that because I think your family has a lot to do with how you've go what you've done in baseball. They do. And I'm fortunate that, that everybody in my family is safe and sound right now as well. My mom and dad, uh, Clint and Louise, live on the East Coast. I'm on the West Coast right now of Florida, a uh, little place called Anna Marie Island. My mom and dad live over in Vieira, which is near Merritt Island, Cocoa Beach area. My mom. Uh, my mom's 85, my dad's 86. I have two younger sisters that both have children. Bobby's my older sister, Robin's my younger sister. And the beautiful thing about our family is we're, we're so well connected and we've been so transparent forever that we all support each other when appropriate, when necessary. Um, we've all been able to count on each other through some very challenging and trying times. My sisters have been as good a supporters of anybody in my life. Uh, wow. You talk bad about their brother, they'll cut you. You, know, <laughs> you, you talk, bad about, talk bad about me to, to my mom, she'll cut you. My dad <laughs> might agree with you every now and then. I don't know. Um, however, they have been with me. You know, I, jokingly, I present my cards with a, my, my parents with an anniversary card every year, and it's the same one. It says, "Thanks for hanging with me through all the tough times." from birth until now. Um, they've never wavered. They provided support. They provided love. They provided tough love. And both of them, my father more than my mother, my father repeatedly has told me what I needed to hear versus what I wanted to hear uh -huh. throughout my life. Throughout my life. Um, and he's a great question asker. Uh, he was my only coach until junior high um, in all the sports. Um, he loved and had a passion for teaching sport. Um, baseball was his number one passion. However, he dabbled in football and basketball as well. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of my father, what I got to recognize over the years, was the number of friends I have that still talk about my dad as a coach. The actual relationships he built with other kids my age that I was kind of aware of, but I really didn't know. I've got, I've got a dozen friends to this day that'll tell you stories about my dad that just make me so proud, make me so, so happy. Uh, they're so uh, entrusted to him and his support. My mother was a, a leader of her own. In fact, she led the family from the side and from behind. Um, she was the educator in our family. Mm. Um, she was the one that really provided school support, educational support. Uh, the stick to it attitude, the grit that you needed, the, the preparation 
and the habits you needed to develop be it to be a good student, uh, to be a good, a good family member, a good friend. So, and then my sisters have grown up and done so well. They married so well, um, both of them. Um, to this day, um, I'm so proud of. My younger sister has three children. Um, two are graduated, two off on their own, two engineers. Everybody went to Florida. Uh, and, and I still have a, a younger niece who's still in Florida. It's her senior year. But the two boys who graduated, Ryan and Reed, have graduated. They're engineers. One's in Washington, D.C. One's in Denver, Colorado. Ryan just, uh, Reed just recently married. Alexa, beautiful girl. My sister has raised kids like she wrote the book on it. It's been <laughs> crazy to watch them develop and grow. Um, my other sister, she wrote another book, but it's, it's another parenting book. She's got twins, and they're both seniors in college this year. Um, and they are both so completely different. It's been awesome to watch their journeys, but to watch my sister's journey. She's always found ways to, to get involved, to stay active, to support not just her, but her husband and the family. So just proud of my family. Uh, we're well connected. And we still dish it out, too. I mean, we, you, you got to be tough to be in this family. You got to have some, some tough skin because there's times when, you know, we'll rat each other out from time to time. We had a Zoom conference call uh, the Sunday after Easter Sunday. And we were on, we thought we'd be on a half an hour. We ended up spending about an hour and 15 minutes on and the stories just kept flowing. And sure. it was pretty fun. You know, that's awesome. And, and again, you sure there, there's not a little Italian in you at all? <laughs> I have met and embraced and locked arms with so many Italians. I'm sure some has <laughs> rubbed off on me along the way, no doubt. Hey, listen, um, you know, I'm sure, you know, as you're so close to your players and, and everybody, I mean, everybody you're, you're, you're with you, that you meet, I'm sure you get a lot of texts, a lot of calls during these times, um, you know, asking for help, you know, possibly, you know, what, how players should be preparing, how get, get, you know, how to get through this, this tough times right now where everybody's shut down. Um, what's some of your advice? I know you, you have a text that you send out to, I think it's 3,000 people every day, and it's, it's awesome. I, I see them every day. Um, but what's your advice out there to uh, let, maybe, you know what, even more, what are some of the questions people might be asking you and the advice you're giving? Well, the, the number of players, it's, it's dwindled to some degree because I asked for some separation for them and for us. I've got ex players that still reach out to me. A lot of those are still, we're connected. But actually, all the players last year from the Pirates, you know, there'll be a time for that. But there needs to be some separation. They got a new manager, they got a new coaching staff. Mm -hmm. Those guys need their own opportunity to build relationships and develop relationships. I was in their ears for some of them for eight, nine years, some of them uh, the last couple of years. Some are probably glad they're not hearing from me right now. Um, I've always tried to be a hope broker. I can't say always. Um, but when I had my own conversion, my own come to Jesus meeting, my own male menopause, I call it, when I tried to figure out my why, what am I supposed to do here? What am I supposed to do with the gifts I've been given? How can I provide support, encouragement, and help to others? I was very self-centered and very uh, selfish uh, for early part of my career um, and my adulthood, really. Um, however, now, the message now needs to be one of, of hope. And, and, you know, it's called kind of based off the Stockdale paradox, which Stockdale, Admiral Stockdale was held in a Vietnam concentration camp for years. And he kept telling everybody the reason he got through because it was an honest evaluation of where he was dealing with reality but optimism for the future. However, he didn't fall in the trap of saying, I need to get out in a week. I need to get out in a month. I need to get out in a year. Because when dates or deadlines, you set them and they come and they go and what you wanted to have happen didn't happen, you get dejected, you get frustrated. So it's dealing with reality. However, having optimism that things are going to get better because you are in control of some of the things that can help them get better. And right now, we need everybody to follow the rules. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Each individual family needs to become its own little tribal unit from my, from my viewpoint to connect with one another. This is kind of like we got thrown back in the 50s out of nowhere. Yeah. Well, let's find a way to work through this season of crisis, develop trust, develop, develop some hope um, based on faith and based on facts, um, lead by example. I'm big on modeling the behavior you want to instill in others. 
Uh, I was explaining the definition of my, uh, to my daughter Madison today, our special needs child, about being a hypocrite. I said, Maddie, it's, it's when your actions don't meet up with your words. It's like when I say I'm going to be nice today and I end up getting in three arguments with your mother. I'm not being nice. Um, our actions are what attract people to us. Think about one of the first things children do in the house when they can get up and move around and find their way around. Somebody puts on dad's shoes. Somebody puts on mom's dress. It's a hat. They see their folk. They want to be like their folks. They're their first figures of admiration. Now, over time, that can build or it can decrease. Mm. It can increase or it can decrease based on what they see happen in the home. How does, your, how does the father treat the mother? How does the father treat the other siblings? How does the mother interact? We need to be a strong family unit through this time. We need to serve one another. We, everybody counts. Everybody matters. You know, the fun thing I've, I've tried to do here is washing my hands. I mean, washing my hands wasn't even a thing. And that's the entitlement <laughs> yeah. and the trap I've fallen into over yeah. years. And now either it's the Lord's Prayer or the Serenity Prayer while I'm washing my hands. It guarantees me 20 seconds. It has value. My kids hear it. They pick up on it from time to time. That's one of the ways that I can just lead by example. I'm not doing it because somebody's tape recording me. I'm not doing it for show. I'm doing it because it's meaningful to me. And we have spent a lot of time on the serenity prayer in our family. For those of you that don't know it, but it starts with God grant me the serenity. And what I've shared with my kids now and some of my close friends, players that have reached out, ex-players that have reached out, coaches that have reached out, God grant me the serenity. Not the stock market grant me the serenity. Not the grocery market grant me the serenity. Not my job, not my check, because truly everybody has, the, the playing field's been leveled in a lot of similar ways for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. There's people that have had money and thought they'd never worry about money that yeah. are worried about money. Yeah. There's people that got a job, thought they'd never worry about a job, they're probably worried about jobs. Yeah. Um, it has taken everybody to a different place than they were at two months ago. So. We need to be steadfast. We need to be committed. We need to have good habits. Um, we need to believe that through every season of crisis, people have come out stronger, yes. more connected, more cohesive with more opportunity. It is so sad for the deaths. It is so sad for the loss of money and job and employment and the, and the restaurants and, and, and all the people that are affected, the, the, the middle market, the jobs. I, I, I don't understand that, but I, I have sympathy. Um, however, I do know that through every pandemic, every crisis, opportunity for growth, change, conviction can all be strengthened and it can be better than it ever was. You know, agree. And I can see right away, you know, how positive a lot of things are going to be after this. As you said, a lot of great habits are going to be created. Families are getting together. You know, there's a lot, everybody's always looking at the negatives. Well, there's a lot of positives that, that can come out of this. And you and your life, it wasn't always rosy all the time. You were, you know, number one pick. You know, they called you a this year's phenom. You, you then had to go into, you know, after playing baseball, you then went into coaching. I'm sure things weren't easy all the way along, you know, across the, your life. Um, talk about some of the things that you learned throughout your life in baseball that then you took into managing your players and your staff and your coaches. Um, you know, the, the one thing that, that I brought up, I continue to bring up, if you hunt for good, you'll find it. If you hunt for bad, you'll find it. What do you want to hunt? What kind of hunter do you want to be? Um, the other thing is I, I try and share with people, it's perception is real. Connection is real. And relationship is real. If you want to develop a relationship, it's the best way to build a cohesive family, a cohesive team as a leader. There's got to be connection, and it's got to be real. People got to know that you care about them. People need to know that you care about them other than their skill set. Um, you care about them at home. You care about them if they're their families. You care about uh, what they're doing away from the, away from the park, away from the job. Um, there needs to be a heartbeat to everything we do, and we don't need to become so service oriented or systematic in our in our service that we lose the heartbeat we lose the personal touch yes we're not connected personally right now but you can still touch people 
if you spend time on here and I'm looking at you, Peter, I'm going to tell you, I care about you. Yeah, it sounds nice, but I mean it. I care about you. Now, how do I back that up? Hmm. You know, I, one of the ways I tried to back it up was when you reached out to me to do this thing. I said, yes, I'll a do it. Absolutely. That's a big deal for me. Well, but it yeah. shows that, okay, I care about Peter Clendon. I care. I want to help. Three questions that I've always had when I was a young player in junior high, uh, through the minor leagues, through the big leagues, and I've shared this with every player and every group that I've had for a number of years. If we can get these three questions answered, if we're the leader of a team, if we're a head coach, if we're, if we're a superintendent, if we're running a business, if we're running a restaurant, managing a big league club, three questions we can get for our employees, our players to, to answer these questions. We will have an opportunity to develop the relationship, to engage in a trust, to build a trust bridge or to build a relationship based on trust. That will open a door up for coaching. That will open up a door up for making them better. And that will open up a door for them to know that you truly care about them other than the skill set they're bringing to the table. So the first question is, can I trust you? I mean, I've asked employers that. And when I had my first sit down with the Pirates, I looked, I looked at the, the leadership group there and I said, can I trust you guys? They came, they came immediately with answers. I've actually asked, asked some pretty important people over my timeline about, can I trust you? And I had one guy that says, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, can I trust you? He said, I don't understand the question. I said, it's a pretty simple question. I'm not here to demean you, but can I trust you? <laughs> he said, well, what do you mean? Personally or professionally? I go, both. <laughs> I mean, but it, was, it caught yeah. him off guard. Sure. It caught him off guard. And once we, 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 you know, for me, dumbed it down, no, here's what I mean. He goes, oh, my gosh, what a great question. Nobody's ever asked me that. Because if you'll think back to the days when you and I were kids, trust was more, it was given more than it was earned. Mm -hmm. Based on your position, your title, or whatever, it was just given. It was yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, and it was given. Yep. Well, now, those days are gone. You earn trust. So can I trust you? Can I trust you personally? Can I trust you professionally? And that has to be earned. Because the second question is, can you make me better? Now, have you ever listened to anybody coaching you that you didn't trust? You'd listen to them for a little bit, but do you really, are you all in? Nope. You're going to nod your head a lot and wait, can't wait for them to shut up and yeah. you can get on to your next task. I mean, I've been that guy. I'm sure I've had players do it to me. So can I trust you? Can you make me better? But they're not going to let you even give you the attempt to make them better until they trust you. So we got to nail number one. We got to earn their trust. That's by modeling the behavior you want to instill in others. By showing up every day, the way I walk in that clubhouse, the way I used to walk in that clubhouse, the way I walk in this house here. How do I handle adversity? How do I handle failure? How do I handle disappointment? How do I handle success? So can I make you better? Yes. I would tell them, yes, I want, to, I want you to know we can make you better. However, we've got to earn that trust so you'll put down your guard and let us in. And then do you care about me is the third question. Do you really care about me? Am I just a middle, middle infielder with, with average speed, with plus bat, um, that, you know, I've still got two options left. Do you know all the analytics about me? And do you know the human analytics about me? Do you know that I came from a – a mother that raised me, that my father passed away in the service, or a broken family, or whatever the story might be. Because I've found out more often than not, if I'm dealing with a young man and there's been a gap of male mentorship in his life, if there wasn't a fatherly figure involved for whatever reason, that needs to be known, at least talked about if he's willing to right away, because that, that harbors a lot of information for you. Most of those guys are still looking for that figure. Mm. it could be a coach it could be the manager it could be the principal of the school it could be you know it can be the the guy that you're working for at walmart or at target um so get those three questions that's what i would share with my coaches all the time that's what i would share with the players earn the trust build the relationship show them you care about them more when they fail than when they have success because when they have success everybody's there for them yeah that's easy the posse's long the bandwagon's big. However, when things start to fall apart, who's around? I I've been that guy. It's lonely. It can be very lonely. And the people that connected with me when things weren't good were the ones that resonated. 
the greatest ability we can have, Peter, as men is dependability. And that's showing up the same way for everybody, not just because a guy's got a title or a guy doesn't have a title. Or a guy makes a lot of money, a guy doesn't make a lot of money. Because someday the guy's not making a lot of money, might make a lot of money. The guy without yes. that might have a title. That's not why you're doing it. You're doing it just because you care about them as a person, where they are in the space they're in right now. You know, um, one of the things I read that was interesting that, that you uh, had told your coaches is that in the clubhouse, you always wanted to know the feeling that's going on in the clubhouse. So you, you leaned on your coaches a lot to figure that out. How, why was that so important to understand what's going on in the clubhouse? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, I didn't like this. I learned over time. I didn't need to be in the clubhouse all the time. The players don't want me in the clubhouse all the time. It's the player's clubhouse. It's called a clubhouse. It's the manager has an office. Coaches have their offices. It's kind of like what I tried, what I learned over time. It's kind of like two houses that, that are next door to each other and they both have dogs, but they got a chain link fix in the backyard. Yeah. <laughs> the dogs run up and down, they chase, they play. However, no dog doesn't go in the other dog's yard. I wanted just to know the vibe. Were they confident? Were they scared? Uh, were there some clicks being formed? Mm. Just so different ways to talk to the leadership group or individuals. Somebody left out. Can you see somebody isolating? Um, I'd love to give them every opportunity to develop their own clubhouse culture, to build it. You know, I didn't want them to think it had to be something that I had to okay. Um, they needed to be respectful. They needed to be professional. They also need to have fun. When you go there as often as you do, we actually, during the season, spend more time in the clubhouse together than we do with our families. Yes. We do. It's, it's yep. a true it's a fact. fact. So why would it not be a safe haven? It needs to be a safe haven, not where they're walking around on pins and needles. Wonder if the coaches will keep walking through, the manager keeps walking through. What's he thinking? Uh, one of the other ways I would, I would try and do this, for the coaches would give me some feedback, but I'd also pick players off, and I did this annually, that I would say, what do you think, the player I'm talking to, what do you think, Starling Martin, what do you think my expectations are of you this year? Mm. And, for instance, uh, he would say, well, to, to hit 300, to win a gold glove, to steal 30 bases. i go, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, that'd be a really good season. <laughs> I said, my expectations for you this year are to lead by example, to mm. play hard when you're on the field, to run balls out, to run balls down in the outfield, steal bases when we need you to steal bases, put the barrel on the ball, be a tough out at the plate, control your attitude and your effort, and your energy, and be a positive force on this team and be a good teammate. Those are my expectations of you. Wow. You know, and, and you talk about expectations. Are those same expectations? And, folks, we're going to take questions on Facebook. So, and we got a ton of people on Facebook, and we'll only be able to take a few questions. Glenn, are those expectations different for every player? Because some of them sound like they're for every player. Some of them are for every player. I use that as an example. Mm -hmm. But then for Starling, you know, there may be something that happened in the past that we, it can't happen again. You know, he had a PED suspension. Um, he spent time away. It hurt players. There was some anger, some angst. So there were some things along those lines that we needed to talk about. So they are individualized. Uh, they're also the team concept, team cohesion always needs to be made apparent because the team expects you to show up ready to play every day, you know, those kind of things. So there were some team building blocks involved in those, and there's also individual building blocks based on the relationship I'd already developed with them or was trying to develop with them moving forward. Um, one of the other things that, you know, you mentioned earlier, um, but I had players that would ask for some, just some positive messages, some reinforcement. You know, players mm -hmm. like to watch good video. They call it dig me tapes. Yeah. You know, we would have our video guy make them five minutes of nothing but great catches in the outfield, good at bats, hard hit balls, pitchers striking out guys, getting double plays. However, some of those messages you talked that I send out, basically I do have an email subscription out. And I don't know if that's the one you were talking about or the text. Some the, te the, text, the text, yeah. I'll do the text individually for some mm -hmm. people that have asked for them. But there's actually an email program that I send out every day, six days a week. And all you got to do is go to clinthurl.com. It's free and it's easy to subscribe. There's either a devotional for those that are faith-based or one of encouragement for leadership and mm -hmm. encouragement. So you can pick one, you can pick both. 
free and easy, clenthurdle.com. The web's the web page is, you know, it's eight sentences. Um, and it's a way that I've found to connect to people, still connecting to former players with some positivity, some encouragement, some support. We all need it. We absolutely all need it. You know, Clint, you know, I was thinking, and we're going to put the show notes on the show notes, Clint's information that he's talking about uh, so everybody can get to that. You know, I'm always looking at the major league clubs, you know, the ones that don't have a lot of money, but yet are successful. Um, you know, the Pirates, especially when they came in the Chicago, but anywhere, they've always played hard. They always battled you. you. You won quite a bit, but yet you didn't have a huge payroll. What are some of the characteristics why some of these clubs can be so successful, yet you might have a club that spends over, you know, $150 million and not as successful? If I'm an owner, I'd like to look at the clubs that are not spending as much. Why are they being so successful? Well, it, it comes down to formulating a game plan. Um, and I think, you know, it's nice when you keep the business model away from the, the sport model. Now, they do need to hybrid in some areas. Uh -huh. However, in Pittsburgh, when you, can, when you can maximize your capacity of attendance at, at 40,000 and you can do it 80 times, I mean, you know that – you know, actually, it wasn't 40,000. It was closer to 30,000. It was a little bigger than Fenway. Um, I think it maybe 38. Anyway, you can only draw so many fans. So then you got to find ways to, to, to increase revenue other ways. Larger metropolitan areas have the ability to draw more revenue. Sure. I mean, Dodger Stadium, you could put 50, 60,000 people in there times 80, plus the parking, wherever it goes. So it's not a level playing field. So that's okay. Everybody knows that going in. Now mm -hmm. you got to find ways to eliminate the separation. Number one, you can't make mistakes. You know, you can't make as many mistakes and you can't <laughs> throw money at everything. And that's been one of sometimes, you know, when you have money, you spend it. When you don't have money, you can't spend it. So when you can spend it, you've got to have almost like a sniper focus to what you're going to invest your money into and who you're going to invest your money into. So one of the things we try to do, they've done it well in Oakland. They've done it well in Tampa Bay. There's mm -hmm. some other places that have done it well. Um, but I can remember before the Yankees got really good again, there was a period of years where they spent a billion dollars and never had a playoff game, you know, on, on, on payroll. Sure. A billion dollars, like in five years, and not one playoff game. Right. Um, so it's investing in your people, and it's having those people that, that work – the baseball ops, you know, your farm directors, your, your player development people, all committed to, to a, you know, to a, to a mindset that is uh, collaborative, that's cohesive, uh, that's player friendly, um, that's relationship built. You got to look for men. You're going to look more often at men of character, men of integrity, men with guts and grit. Um, you tell them the deal going in, what they're signing up for. It's no hidden agenda. Um, most of the pirate players know when they come in, if they get to be really good, there's probably not going to be a huge free agent contract for them at the end of six years. It's not, going to, it's not the way it works. Um, so you let them know the truth, and then you deal with it from there and how to help them be the best player they can be while they're there. You know, Cole was a pirate. Morton was a pirate. You know, they went on to do bigger, better things other places. And they're making a ton of money right now. Mm -hmm. You know, they've earned their way. However, there was a time when I do believe we were able to help them. They were able to help us. Um, but it's just being realistic and, and knowing that I think all of us have a little bit of a DNA click in us when we're the underdog that you want to prove you're more than. Um, one of the beautiful things we always got to do that I love was go play the best teams. Go play the big payroll teams. Because we can, on any given night, we can beat anybody. And that's why I used to continue to share with the players. We can beat anybody tonight. Anybody. And comparing, that's a really scary place to go. And it and it's, can be a really <clears throat> dangerous place to go, whether you're a player or a coach. Because two things happen when you compare yourself to others. You either feel better than or you feel less than. If you feel better than, you can get prideful. That's not a good place to be. If you feel less than, you get envious. That's not a good place to be. Both of mm -hmm. them are part of the seven deadly sins. There's two of them. Um, you know, it's 
it's keeping them humble and hungry. And I would share with our players all the time, there's two kinds of people in life and in sport. Those are humble and those that are about to be. Mm, yes, I, I saw you. It, it's, it's happened to all of us. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, be, own the time and the space that you're in right now. You can't control what happened yesterday. You've, you don't have a guarantee that you're going to deal, get to deal with tomorrow. So let's leverage today. Let's absolutely wipe out today. Let's do the best we can today. So there were some of the thoughts that we would share with our staff, our players coming in. And, and the fact that in the greater good, if you play well here, you're going to get a chance to play well somewhere else and get paid more. You know, and it's a, it seems like a daily motivation because, you know, you know, you got ups and downs in a long season. You talked about um, keeping the game fun. Sometimes it's easier said than done because, you know, people can say, let's have fun. But what exactly, like, what, what did you do as a manager to kind of keep things loose once in a while? And when did you do those? Was it when they had bad times, good times? Well, what you try and do is keep them guessing. Ah. Um, you don't want to become so set in your habits that they know or kind of expect a reaction because you've done it that way before and you've done it over and over that sure. way before. So I put them in charge of some things. We, we'd had a senior leadership group from time to time, or then I would have a dress code group. They established a dress code. They would establish, I said, okay, themes. Come up with some themes for us to travel as a team. You know, whether it's a disco trip, you know, we, we all dress. Uh, a lot of other people got more notoriety for their trips, but we took trips all the time. It's just it something we felt we needed to, to publicize or talk about. Uh, you know, there could be an NBA trip. We'd honor the Penguins with a trip. Come hockey season, come playoff hockey time. Your favorite NFL jersey we would wear or a theme, like I said, you know, back to the 80s. Um, we did some Star, Star Wars, Star Trek, Halloween. We dressed up for Halloween. Everybody just wore a Halloween costume. So those were some of the things we did in-house. We did some team building things where it was we put together cooking, cooking classes where it was like the, the, the chef where we put together six guys and they have to come up with their own concoction, uh, little pockets of group where we'd have scavenger hunts or, or whatever, just out of nowhere, a random show up late day or a bunch of them where um, you didn't come, you couldn't come in the park before four o'clock. You couldn't come in before four o'clock. Don't try and come in. So we try and help them break up the norm where they didn't become a slave to a routine. Mm. Or think, oh, we played bad. We got to show up earlier tomorrow. No, we need to play better when we're on the field. Maybe we can tweak our preparation. Maybe there's time for you know an early workout, but maybe there's time for not an early workout. Or maybe there's time that we pull the plug and we let the players host the scout meeting instead of us putting it to tell the players to share with each other on what they know and what they've learned and how they're going to attack. What are we going to do to win the game tonight? What are we do to win the series? And one of the things that we always encouraged was after the wins, to celebrate the wins, come up with a play of the game that, that tilted the game in our fashion, come up with a, a bat of the game, which tilted the game in our fashion, come up with a, you know, a, a pitching performance of the game. And, and some of the cool things that can happen from that, Peter, that, you know, it could have been Jared Hughes coming and rolling a grown ball double play in the sixth inning at Wrigley to get out of a jam in a game we eventually won. Came in, he threw three pitches, but he got a double play ground ball. He wasn't the winner. He didn't get the save. Could have been the biggest pitch we threw all day. Yes. Jordy Mercer comes up, hits a hit and run double to score the, the tying run and gets on second and then eventually gets knocked in uh, by Adam Frazier, who was the leadoff hitter, and we win by one run. But it's a hit and run, which all he's trying to do is move a runner. He does it so successfully. Not only moves that runner, he scores and puts himself in scoring. Which is, that, that would be your, you know, your, your bat of the game. And – and maybe a defensive play of the game where somebody lays out um, and makes a catch that, that stops an inning where the base is loaded where it could be safe to foul ball. We had a couple of these happen where a guy dove for foul ball, foul territory, makes a catch, multiple men on base. If he doesn't make that catch, what happens? We'll never know, but what could happen? Yeah. Those three could score, more could score, who knows, but that play in and of itself, even though it wasn't the ninth inning, foul territory – but that could turn out to be the play of the game. So you find a way to celebrate the successes. And we've always encouraged, always encouraged for them to celebrate each other's successes. It was so cool to see Andrew McCutcheon hugging Josh Harrison or, you know, A.J. Burnett 
hugging somebody that came out of the bullpen uh, and, and did a job where it's not always the, the leader, the so-called leader. You know, Russell Martin hitting the home run off Cueto in the, in the blackout game in 2013 after mm-hmm. Cueto dropped the ball in the mound a couple times. Those guys went nuts over Russell Martin when he got it back in the club. But to have that type of camaraderie where you've got one common goal and nobody cares who gets the credit. That's a usually a good way to, to keep it fun, to keep it light. And one of the things that was important for me was the way I walked in the clubhouse every day. So you couldn't tell whether we won by 10 or lost by 10. And I told my coaches, I expected that from, from them as well. When you walk in, you're done. You're done being at home. You're invested fully here and the men that are here and the game we're going to play later. So bring your A game now to that clubhouse and put on your A face, a real face, a people person face. You know, your buddy Steve Springer says here on Facebook, and we're going to take a question. He said he stole the cue from you that you invented. He uses the cue a lot. So he's giving you a shout out. Um, good. Uh, well, college coach Greg Frady, he's the was the German national team coach for the World Baseball Classic. I had a question, um, you know, when taking players that are highly talented, um, but they're also high maintenance. Uh, you know, how do you deal with those type of players? And in a short period, like the World Baseball Classic, maybe Clint Hurdle might be a manager one day. It'd be great to see him in the World Baseball Classic. But in a short series like that, to put together a team, that's not easy either. Some advice on both of those. Um, well, where I would start personally is from a group setting, I'd explain this has got a shelf life, guys. We are here for a set period of time. Obviously, the better we play, the longer we get to play. If we don't play well, we're out quick. So I'm going to encourage everybody to whatever, whatever ego you brought in, get rid of it. Mm. Get rid of it. For this time, we need everybody to be on the same page, to be on a level playing field. We need everybody to show up to help the club win that day. You know, roles could change. We'll figure that out as we go on. There's going to be guys we're going to count on maybe a little bit more than others, but we're going to need everybody's support, preparation, focus, game skills. You know, it could be a pinch hit at bat. It could be a late inning relief guy out of the bullpen. No one guy needs to carry this thing. We're going to need everybody's help and support. And then if there's some guys that I may know of individually, I'm going to try and touch everybody individually. Because as I said before, everybody counts, everybody matters. But if there may be somebody, I say, hey, this is, this is, this is different for me. How can I help you? You know, I don't know what your routine is. I don't know what your mindset is. Can you help share with me your thoughts about what this means to you, if it means something to you? What can I do to make the transition easier for you? Get, get in your way, get out of your way, support of a coach, support of the players, but just to have those real FaceTime conversations um, to try and break it down where you're not going to, and I would share this with the club, we can't spend an inordinate amount of time on any one individual, any three individuals. We got to pour into everybody. And we got to tighten this thing because it's kind of like a choir or an orchestra. You know, flute music for an hour, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, guitar music for an hour, I'm better than, but, but I'm out. Anything just one-dimensional for an hour, I'm probably out. But now you, if you put a flute, a drum, and a guitar together, oh, my gosh, I can listen to that forever. So that's what we need to do with the team concept in here. We need to find a way to hybrid this, to mesh this, to put this together so, you know, the sum of the parts is, is much greater in, in, its, in its total. Um, and you guys can do this. I believe with all my heart we can do this. Love it. Terry Ayers, ABC Hall of Fame high school coach, asks, and this is interesting, especially in today's era, um, how much a manager has an input in making lineups, uh, where players are going to play position-wise um, because of, you know, analytics also, and what factors, maybe what factors into those decisions? Well, yeah, it's an interesting time uh, for the game of baseball. And – I was fortunate throughout all my years in Pittsburgh, and really there weren't as many analytics involved in Colorado from 2002 to 2009 when I was there. They had just started to pop. I became introduced to the analytical game in 2009, the year I was fired. I went to work for the MLB Network uh, the second half of the season and spent a lot of downtime just in talking and learning and plugging into things and 
coming up with these different equations and looking at what we're measuring differently and the different definitions other than RBIs and ERA and batting average. Um, how are moving forward? I was walked through it with Neil Huntington, with Kyle Stark, with Dan Fox, the analytical team in Pittsburgh, about the benefits, about the thoughts, about why we were doing it, why were we setting it up. So they educated me first. They mentored me second. And then at the end of the day, they would give me, I would ask for recommendations, whether they were analytical matchups, historical matchups. And the beauty of, of my relationship I have with our general manager, Neil Huntington, was, you know, he would say just what, what I felt. He goes, Clint, if it gets to the point that I can't trust your 40 years in the game, your 40 years in the dugout, shame on me. Yep. So we're going to give you this and then come the lineup. You make out the lineup. The coaches, you, you make out the lineup. I was never given a lineup from any general manager or anybody in the front office and said, this is who you need to play. I never was. We might talk after the game about the next day, some adjustments to be made, some thoughts to be shared, um, people that may need to get a start. But that was just continual flow conversation. I do know of, of programs that have, I really believe I never got one, but different places that you pretty much get handed a cue card. And, you know, it's kind of like the band's dance card. Yeah, I think concert. I knew where you were going. And, and, <laughs> And there, and there you go. That's so, got to be tough to work under. Well, I imagine, I imagine it would be. Um, however, you do the best you can with what you got with where you are. You know what you signed up for. If it comes to the point where you don't like it, you need to get out or move on. Mm -hmm. um, I really believe with constant communication, with real FaceTime, with an exchange of thoughts, you can get the best decision made to represent the organization and the people involved. At the end of the day, though, you know, the ones in the dugout are the ones that bear the most responsibility. Um, because one of the beautiful things we did in, in Pittsburgh was when we brought our analytical team in play, we also brought them to the clubhouse. They set a shot in the clubhouse. They were involved in the team meetings. They went on the road trips. Hmm. And some of these times when you'd have these tilted defenses, and it was kind of – rewarding and interesting to see how we could come in after a game that we may have lost, or maybe we got three shift busters hit on us two in the last inning off our closer, you know, just an example and see the feeling of the analytics guys because they were crushed. Now they're not in an ivory tower. They're not separated. They're not back. In, they're with us. They're living it. That's what they should be. Yeah. Well, we were all connected. Yeah. We were all connected. And then also sometimes you come in after you see them jumping up and down because of a shift that worked or some tweak in the lineup that we made or we all came to a court and saw. So it can be, I believe it is more challenging in some places than others. However, communication needs to, needs to be the first thing in place. And basically it goes back to what are my job requirements? You know, if you're going, going to go in and, and you're in a new situation, what are the expectations for my job requirements? What am I in charge of? What am I not in charge of? You know, what are we all going to handle? And, and what responsibilities fall upon me? I would just make sure I got that all cleared up before I went in. Then once you went, go in, if things change, well, then you talk about the change. And is the change beneficial? Is it something that's hard for the coach and, or, or the manager? And, and there's a different way that we can reconnect it. However, I always believe in, in talking with the people that are engaged in whatever process you're putting together all the time so there's no glitches in communication there's no missteps in communication and then we are connected fantastic love it clint two things um one you know what you demanded of your players daily was some of the things that you you expected them expected out of them and two it's tough to motivate keep mo players motivated they're on the bench what are some of the things you did there um the first conversation I had with any player that was called up to the big leagues or anybody that I got to know knew, I, I tell them the two things. Fear, fear nothing. Respect everything. The game of baseball, respect it. Honor it. Take care of it. Uh, you take care of the game, the game will take care of you. Honor the game. There's so many that have come before you that have put this game in a better place than it was for your benefit, for your opportunity. Never take for granted the name on the front of the jersey. That's a city that you represent. That's a place where you're living. People live here. People grown here generationally. They hold on to this place. They'll fight for this place. Never, never disgrace the name on the front of the jersey. 
that name on the back of the jerseys. That's your family. That's who raised you. That's who you're representing. So you get two names to protect and represent. Never lose sight of that. Not just when you're on the field, when you're off the field as well. Um, that's part of it. And it kind of goes back. If, if, if I saw a player that was struggling with it, um, you know, one of the analogies I've kind of used now is the game's kind of moved, moved forward in some areas. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember what it was like to buy your first car? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It wasn't very nice either. Didn't have to be, though. It was your first car. Yep. Loved it. Did, did you honor it? Absolutely. Did you respect it? Yeah, absolutely. Wash, wax. Yep. I mean, I was first. I waxed an old car. I, I was yep. doing it. I mean, it didn't matter. It was my car. I wanted to look nice. And what about if a buddy got in and spilled something in your car? Oh, man. Upset. Exactly. But you honored it. You respect it. You took care of it. It was yours. You wanted to increase its value, not mm -hmm. lessen its value while you were the owner. Later on in life, you probably ended up having an opportunity to rent some cars, didn't you? Yep. What do you do oh, with yeah. a rental car? My, my mom, uh, did you say wreck some cars? Rent. No, oh, rent. rent. Oh, rent a car. I didn't worry about it. You know, that's the bad part of me. Yeah, just whatever happened inside, it happened. Somebody else will clean it up, which was a, not the way to go. But 90% of the people that rent cars, I think, have a similar mentality. Yeah. You put gas in it to get you where you want to go. So which way do you want to treat this game? Do you want to put gas in it to get you where you want to go? Do you want to honor it, respect it, value it, add value to it, increase its value? Um, I would share that with the players. Or front office people, whoever would come in contact and we'd get to that conversation. Um, the second part of your question was? As far as uh, keeping guys motivated on the bench, you know, yeah. bench players playing or doing something, maybe doing something on the bench that keeps them in the game. I was fortunate that I was an everyday player early in my career. I became a bench player later in my career. So I got to experience both sides of it. Mm -hmm. And I actually absolutely got to experience the value of being a good bench player. I wasn't initially. It's hard to play off the bench. Absolutely. One of the hardest jobs in pro sports, if you're in the NFL, the NBA, to come in for a limited amount of time, have one shot, try and make something happen. That was my life. <laughs> <laughs> so it's first – trying to help them find a routine that puts them in a good place to compete later in the game when they're called upon, whatever that might be. You know, I learned that there's what things I need to do during the game to be ready to play if called upon, not just sit on the bench and watch. Sometimes I would get, we would be given a job that the, the manager might say, Hey, I want you to watch their third base coach for sign. See if you can pick anything up while you're there. Hey, watch our pitcher, make sure he's not tipping his pitches. So, you can delve out responsibilities, your guys on the bench, to watch for certain things in the game or watch certain their hitters over there. Are there any idiosyncrasies you're picking up on? Who looks confident play? Who doesn't look confident? But also the pregame preparation. And then the in-game preparation, there's things you can do now more so than you could ever do when I was a bench player because you got cages right off the tunnel. You can hit, hook up high-velocity machines. You can hit a 100-mile-an-hour fastball, you know, 40, 10 yards down the tunnel and be ready to come in and face a closer. You can put a spin breaking ball machine up and go hit that before your pinch hit at bat to let them know the value, show them the value. And then I always found a way to try and give them a start within a homestand, try and find a way to give them four at bats mm. where their, their self-confidence and self-esteem wasn't tied to that one at bat or it wasn't for a relief pitcher. If they didn't have a good outing, I tried to find a way to get them right back out there the next night or the next night, not to wait a long time and dwell on that failure. I'd also remind them that failure is an event. It's not a person. Mm. You didn't come through in a certain situation. So it's not you. There's a difference between guilt and shame in sport and in life. Guilt is I made a mistake. Shame is I am a mistake. I never wanted, and I would talk to them about that. And then the best tip I ever got from a, from a player about pinch hitting, Rusty Staub gave it to me when I was the Mets. I can remember finally he pulls me aside and goes, Hey, this pinch hitting thing, you're not doing real well with it. What, what do you think? <laughs> I'm trying to win the game. He goes, eh, that's wrong right there. I go, what do you mean it's wrong? He goes, if you were good enough, you'd be playing. I mean, he was very brunt, but it was yeah. what I needed to hear. He told me the truth. He didn't tell me what I wanted to hear. He goes, if you were good enough, you'd be playing. You're not good enough to be playing. So you get one shot at helping those that have played and not played well that night to clean up their mess. There's no pressure on you. It's one at bat. Mm -hmm. They've had four. They've had eight innings in the field. They've had all the opportunity. 
you can't fail. If you go up and strike out, you didn't fail. You, you had one shot. You did the best thing you could. And I go, but I struck. He goes, you got one shot. He goes, this is hard to do. And people that have never done it have no idea how hard it is to do. Most of those guys are playing every day. Don't know how hard it is to do. I'm telling you, the only way I found to have success was I had to have a don't give a you-know-what button. Mm -hmm. You know, I did, but I didn't. I wanted to do well, but I wanted to be ready. I wanted to be prepared, and I wanted to get my best swing off. What happened after that happened after that. Well, he got to be really good at it, and it was amazing how that freed me up to know that I got one at bat. I got, you know, I might have one pitch to hit. Yeah. Just got to do the best I can with what I got with where I'm at. But my preparation had to be elite, and my, and my game readiness had to be elite. Great stuff. Love it. Um, we've got about five more minutes, Clint. You've been more than generous. This has been fantastic. What a show. Um, we're going to take a question from Coach Genke, St. Charles North, as a high school coach. And he asked the question, best time to do a double switch, if there is a best time. <laughs> well, it, you know, more <laughs> often, no, the, the double switch is an important part of the game. You know, American League, you don't have it. Uh, National League, you have it. It can be critical. It can be pivotal um, to – Sometimes it's to bring in an extra hitter. If you're losing and there's some gap, you're just bringing in an extra bat. And you're trying to find that time to put that extra bat in the lap, give him maybe two at-bats, where you can position him to have two at-bats, not just one at-bat. So sometimes, you know, if you're, if you're down and your starters, it's hard with your starter, but if they haven't done well enough, they haven't done well enough. So runners on base, pinch hit opportunity. It's the fifth inning. Your starter's giving you what he's got. It's, say, it's six to four. That's the hard call. If it's six to one, it's not a hard call. You hit. You hit and you move on. You put your best bat in there. You, you, you let him hit with those men on base. And you leave him in the game so that lineup can maybe turn over. Sometimes it's a defensive move. You put a guy in to hit. It's a two-player move. And then maybe if you get the lead or he puts you where he takes the lead, but he's not a good defensive player, maybe you can find a way to put that defensive player, substitute him in that double switch spot. And then you move your, you turn your lineup around. It's always the biggest point is to turn your lineup over where you're not compromised with the pitcher hitting, you know, four guys away, five guys away. It's also to give that next pitcher you're bringing in sometimes an opportunity to pitch with some length, to pitch multiple innings. So depending on what you're doing, trying to score runs, trying to have a, a pitcher eat innings, you know, those are, those are two different times in, in which to employ the double switch. Sometimes it's a perfect time to get that one guy that is like your 12th player, uh, you know, that instead of, he doesn't get a start, but he gets two at-bats that night. Hmm. And maybe it's a game that you're underneath that, but it gets him two at-bats to help him sharp. And maybe it's a guy that needs a couple at-bats and hasn't had them. Um, so those are some different things to look at that I always considered in making a double switch. And they can be very helpful because it, it, from the pitching side of it, it also shows confidence in the guys you're going to, you know, especially if you're going to, to set that guy up to pitch three innings, uh, if possible. You know, he, he knows when you double switch that you've made an adjustment for him to get some, some length of time to work. He doesn't think he's facing one or two guys. Clint, when, uh, as you start as a young manager and you progressed to the major leagues and got to, you know, more experience, what's a message to coaches out there that you've learned that you can – share with them that's important if they're going to manage a club at any level and especially at a youth level a message to them about you know being the best they can be what would that be uh, one of the first things that, that i've i had imprinted upon me was i didn't know it all and the game's hard to play hmm. sometimes the more we get away from the game the longer we haven't played the game the game looks easier um, the game's hard to play, and I need to continually f need to find ways to learn. We call it a white belt mentality, a lifelong learner. If you join a martial arts class, the first belt you get is white. It means you know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so I never wanted to come across as a know-it-all. Hmm. And I found a strength in sharing stories and experiences. People gravitate more to flaws and failure than they do to huge triumphs and trophies. So I would share with the players or a coach, hey, back, you know, when I was doing this, I had this experience, or I made this mistake. You show your human side, you show your transparency. Transparency breeds trust. So how do you find ways to stay transparent? 
where they know that this isn't about you. You're there to be a transformational coach. You're there to help them have success. You're there to help everybody have the most success that they can have, you know, within a team concept and individually. It's not about you getting another contract, about you winning manager of the year, coach of the division, coach of the conference. You are there to serve that coaching staff, that organization, that school, and those players. And they'll know it when it's true. They'll know it when it's fake. Every one of us has come across situations where we knew somebody was faking it mm-hmm. or somebody was in it for their own good. What I used to share was don't be the oh no coach. And what I mean by that, Pete, is you ever had anybody in your life that as soon as he started walking towards you, you dropped your head and went, oh no. Here yeah. <laughs> yes. You yeah. want to be the coach that when you're walking towards somebody, they're right. like, oh, here comes Pete, man. I can't yeah. wait to see Pete. Yeah. Pete's always got something for me. It might be about my wife, my girlfriend, my dog, my hobby, my movie. Maybe it's sport related, but it's Pete. He cares about me. It goes back to those three questions we talked about earlier. But to be authentic, they don't need to be a copy of anybody else. There's things you can learn from other people, but they need to be authentic. Authenticity works. Um, To remember that there's a human heart involved in every player. And every player's got dreams. Every player's got um, expectations. Um, it basically goes down to the ability to put an arm around them um, or smack them on the butt. I mean, hard truth, truth, tough love, love, both are appropriate. An arm around the shoulder, a you know, smack on the backside, both are appropriate. Timing and presentation are critical in a coach and w- with a manager. But at the end of the day, I always held close the golden rule to treat others the way I wanted to be treated. I love that. Love it, love it, love it. And finally, Clint, drilling the small things. The players have said that you drilled the small things into them and your attention to detail was phenomenal. Um, again, you learned that from the past, brought it into your managing. How important? I, I learned it from the past. I had some coaches that were just sticklers of the, you know, they used to say, be, be extraordinary at the ordinary. You know, make all the routine plays. Put away the 27 outs on defense. We might make a couple highlight plays along the way. Make the routine play. Have the good at bat when you need to have the good at bat. We don't need a three-run homer when we're down by 12. Mm. Uh, You know, I mean, what I mean by that is don't be swinging for the fence when the game's out of reach just for personal vindication. There's no such thing as a little thing. And when you overlook little things, they become big things. So. I think it was important that my players knew that I was watchful. I was aware. And I wasn't going to let them get away with less than I thought they were capable of bringing. That was my charge to them, to be the best you can be today. We're about tomorrow. Today, be the best you can be for your team. Be the best you can be for the name on the front, the name on the back. Remember back in the day of the Packers? I mean, Vince Lombardi brought the one play to them, and they ran the one play. I think it was called 16 yeah. in sweep or something. But the, the guys would tell you today, the ones that are still alive, we, we ran that play 15 times a game. Same and we play. Practiced. If you're really good at what you do, Pete, and I used to share this with my coaches, and my team, we can give them our playbook and still beat them. Yes. If we're really good at what we do. John Wooden was the best at it. Never talked about the opponent. Never talked about their skills, how they prepared. Focused on how we prepare to our utmost ability. Wow. Unbelievable. And I'll tell you why, because it brings back my mentor, Dick Birmingham, um, always said the same thing. He said, worry about your club. Don't worry about the other club. If you prepare yours to the best they can be, they'll be better in the end. Um, you know, Clint, I got to believe that sooner or later, and we're, we're, we're going to end here, sooner or later, there's going to be a book, a movie. You still have the passion. I know you took off a couple years to be with your family, and that's awesome. You, you were given some, uh, actually, you, were, you, you had some pretty good job offers. Um, if, if there's that book or movie comes out, here's a little curveball. Who's going to be that actor? Who would you want that actor to play you? I, I got no clue. I, I've, I've actually, I've, I've been, <laughs> been humbled. I've had, I've had 15 people reach out about a book years back since I retired last year. Um, more have been knocking on the door. I'd have to go to my kids to find out who's Kirk. You know, my guys, 
um, a younger version of Clint Eastwood would be right up, be right up my alley. You, you're not going to believe this. In my notes, I was preparing the intro, and I, I said Clint Eastwood instead of Clint Hurdle. And I said, I go, please don't say that, you know, during the intro by mistake, you know, because your brain sometimes can play funny games. I was thinking the exact same thing. Clint Eastwood would be a perfect person. Down to earth. You know, it tells it the way it is, you know, in all his movies, you could always say, he tells it the way it is in the baseball um, movie, uh, The Curve, uh, when he was a scout, remember? I can't remember. Oh, yeah, Can't Hit the Curve? Yeah, I mean, he always told it the way it is. You know, if you didn't like it, you didn't like it, but he told you the truth. Yeah. So uh, that's Clint, Clint Hurdle, no doubt. Clint, you've been awesome, man. This is fantastic. If, I'll leave it to you. Any last words? And, and God bless you, man. No, my last words for everybody, be safe and sound. You know, we all need each other to get through this trying time. And I look for seeing I look forward to seeing everybody on the other side once we all get the all clear. Yes. Absolutely. Folks, that's Clint Hurdle, not Clint Eastwood. I'm Pete Caliendo, host of Baseball Outside the Box. I want to thank everybody in the US and around the world for checking us out on live on Facebook. Thank you for being this show will be on YouTube, so check it out. Um, don't forget, this is a show that loves to interview baseball's best coaching minds who love the challenge of status quo. Wish you the best. God bless you. Be safe at home. And as Clint said, we'll see you on the other side.